Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Kambiz Ranavardi, uh, board member for Columbia, D.C., and a graduate of the School of Engineering and Applied Science. We are uh, honored to have uh, this evening with us Ellen Carr, adjunct associate professor, the Heilbronn Center for Graham and Dodd Investing at Columbia Business School, as well as Katrina Dudley, senior vice president, investment strategist, and portfolio manager at Franklin Templeton to talk about the, their uh, most recent book on diversified the big gender short in investment management published by Columbia University Press. Please allow me to briefly introduce our speakers. Uh, Ellen Carr has over two decades of experience as a high yield bond portfolio manager, most recently at uh, Barksdale Investment Management, a majority women-owned institutional fixed income investment management firm. She's also an adjunct professor of finance at Columbia Business School, where she teaches courses on the credit markets and cash flow modeling. She's uh, also a frequent contributor to the Financial Times. And Katrina Dudley uh, is a global equity portfolio manager at Franklin Templeton Investments, one of the world's largest asset managers. She's the author of the Introduction to the Vault Career Guide to Mutual Funds, published in 2016. She's also a frequent market commentator on CNBC and Bloomberg, a mentor to up and coming female investment professionals and a guest lecturer at Columbia Business School and the Stern School of Business. Uh, without further ado, uh, please take it away. All right, great. Thank you so much for being here tonight with us, both of you. Uh, my cat is trying to sneak into this video here. Um, but I know that we had tried to host this event on International Women's Day, but both of you or one of you was busy, which is great. It means that you're getting out there. Um, so thank you for making this happen today on Wednesday. Uh, my name is Miyako and I will help moderate the discussion today. Um, I know we want to get into this book. We did get a short bit of intro from each of you from Cumbies, um, but I'm hoping that each of you can give us a little bit more of a bio and then kind of how that background led you to your origin story for this book. So maybe Ellen, if we can start with you and then go to Katrina. So maybe Katrina, we can start with you while Ellen tries again. <laughs> Okay, so while we we uh, we lose, so my uh, my career background, I've been in invest in equity investing for over twenty years, and um, you know I started the typical way. I started, I actually started my career in valuation advisory, moved into investment management, um, and then you know when when I you know when I. Um, moved into investment management, uh, one of the things is I noticed there were no women in the room. And, um, you know, when, when, you know, 20 years later, you fast forward, and I think that same dynamic is still there. And that's kind of the, you know, the, 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 the spec, the, the path that led us and, and Ellen and I to, to write this book is this, it's kind of this innate frustration um, that despite the fact that both of us have found this a very attractive career, we think it's a very, you know, it's a rewarding career. It's, it's, it's ever changing. Um, and we think it's a really great career for women, as well as for men, but for women in particular, um, we were just surprised at that failure for the statistics to move over, over the course of 20 years. And that's not just in the United States that it hasn't moved, it's, it hasn't moved internationally and globally as well. So you know, we're, we're not on our own in terms of we haven't been able to increase the representation of women in, in portfolio management. So my career is, is, is a fairly much a straight line. Ellen, um, maybe you could start with your career and then uh, share the, the history of how the book came to be. Yeah, so can you hear me now? It is the, the, the frequent Zoom question. Sorry about that. I neglected to click the little join with computer audio button when I logged in. So anyway, um, thank you, uh, Candies. Thank you, Miyako, for hosting us. Uh, I was saying when I was on mute that it's great to be getting our message out to the DC area. Last night, I was actually in Nashville doing a CFA event there. So the reception for the book is, is really heartwarming. And um, Katrina and I love talking about it. Um, so the origin story of the book, from my perspective, really starts with Columbia. Um, so I'm really glad that, that we're here talking to a Columbia alum association. Um, as Kimbees mentioned, I'm an adjunct at the business school there. Katrina is a frequent guest lecturer in my class, and I had 
observed informally with a number of the other adjuncts at the business school that while the student body at Columbia is, is inching towards parity at the business school, so it's over 40% women, um, we struggled to find uh, you know, that many women that wanted to take our classes. And the adjuncts at Columbia Business School, for those of you who are not familiar with it, are typically drawn from Wall Street because they're right there uh, in New York, not as close to Columbia as they are to Stern, where Katrina went, but, but pretty close. Um, so uh, we sort of scratched our heads and said, you know, for a student body that's, that's getting towards parity, why are we only seeing 10-ish percent of our classes um, be female? And that was sort of dovetails with what Katrina mentioned, which is that it's great to um, get the word out about the fact that this is a great career for women. Um, and so I very... Uh, what's the word, kismet-ish, uh, ran into Katrina at Central Park right after having had lunch with all these adjuncts at Columbia and being introduced to somebody at Columbia Press who um, was kind of the spark that we needed to, to talk to each other about writing a book together, which was truly a labor of love. And um, it just, uh, it sort of ran on from there. Great. And uh, Katrina, you mentioned kind of the the industry has been changing, but it hasn't quite been changing that much. So if you can just give us a little bit of a history, kind of going back 10 years or so, what did the industry look like in terms of representation of women, specifically in investment management? And then um, to today, kind of how has that trajectory over the past decade changed? I'm muting myself. Um, it's been lousy. I mean, we haven't changed. Um, you know, 11% of portfolio managers are women, 11. Um, that means for every, you know, th there's just, I mean, basically for every one woman, there's nine men sitting in the room. And so from at that perspective, as I mentioned, we haven't, we haven't shifted. Um, you know, some of the studies that we looked at actually thought we got up to as high as 13, 14% and then went backwards. Um, and, and that's even more disappointing that we had made some progress and gone back somewhat. We're just, the data there is a little messier and a little murkier because some, the definition of portfolio your manager has is, is not quite a, a cut and dried decision of what is a portfolio manager. For example, um, you have institutional portfolio managers and client portfolio managers, which are the equivalent of the IR or the investor relations for the funds that they, they represent, but they're not the decision makers. And in our analysis and in all the interviews, we focused on the decision makers. Um, you know, when we look at our industry, we compare I mean, 10% compares very poorly on the portfolio management side. It compares with finance generally, it's around 35%. And what we, however, have found um, is within our industry specifically, um, if you look at the headline numbers, they really overrepresent the number of women in decision-making roles and those key decision-making roles, because a lot of the diversity is sitting in, in what we call our back office function. So, you know, the behind the scenes functioning and, and those careers are not the portfolio management at careers, number one. Number two, they have much slower promotion cadences. And number three, they are less, for, you know, less people in those roles tend to have lower financial compensation. So we focus on a narrow um, industry which was investment management. Um, the other thing and the reason that we, we were very fortunate to focus on this industry, I don't think Ellen and I realized it when we started studying it, but when you start out that study the lack of gender diversity, having an industry which has objective performance criteria, which is what we have, um, is very helpful because it means it's not performance related that's driving the lack of diversity. You can really understand those true drivers of the lack of diversity. Um, Ellen, you mentioned earlier kind of how you thought the school was getting close to gender parity, uh, but you weren't seeing it in your classes specifically. Have you seen other industries that have been able to get closer to that gender parity? And do you have any thoughts on why they might have made more progress than investment management has? Yeah, so one of the, one of the ways that we um, approached this was debunking some myths or some, some common um, perceptions about why women might not be choosing our industry. And that, that um, gets to you know, the difference between our industry and other industries. So 
People often think that work-life balance is the reason that women don't choose to go into a certain industry. Um, however, when we interviewed uh, lots of women in the industry who you know, have been doing it for a long time, who have all different sorts of family situations, you know, everything from Katrina, who is a supreme overachiever and has four kids, to me, I have one, um, you know, we saw lots of comments that, that all boil down basically to the same comment, which was, this is not an industry that's got worse work-life balance um, metrics than some of the other industries where women have greater representation. So law, for example, there is a higher percentage of female law partners than there is portfolio managers. And the, the portfolio manager and the partner track are not completely analogous, but we were trying to come up with the best comps as we do um, in investing for the different industries that, that we looked at. Um, medicine, now medicine, of course, um, it depends on the specialty, right? So I think Katrina mentioned that there's, there's lots of differences um, based on surgeons you know, who bring down the big bets versus pediatricians, which tend to be more skewed towards women. But one of the things that we wrote about in the book was some really great studies that have been done of the medicine industry, which show that um, doctors, can job share in a way that, at least as of now, is not permitted in our industry. Um, so there's this idea that, you know, it's your portfolio, or if you're an analyst, your industry. And we sort of shake our head and say, why wouldn't job sharing be a great solution to this for women who want to have more, um, more work-life balance in our industry? Um, but the, the, leaving aside what, what we don't think the reasons are, um, what we found were a number of, we described them as socio-cultural or psychocultural barriers um, to women in our industry, which are not um, obvious, they're very subtle, but the problem with subtle barriers is that they're much harder to disassemble. Um, so let's take kind of the, the bro culture. We don't have one of those nasty me too types of images that lots of other industries like the tech industry, for example, has. Um, in fact, we, we often like to say that we may manage money for the Harvey Weinsteins of the world, but we don't tend to work with them. By and large, the men we work with are a pretty, you know, generic sort of nerdy um, sitting behind a spreadsheet lot. Um, so, so that is not a problem. However, the culture that has arisen around the concept of money is very gendered. And this goes all the way back to, I won't say in utero, um, but certainly with very young children in the same household, there's a study that showed that parents talk to sons and daughters in the same family differently about money. They're more likely to talk to daughters about budgeting and saving. They're more likely to talk to sons about investing. Um, and so when you start from, from such a young age with this concept of money management that skews male, and then you marry that with a lot of the um, popular image uh, images, you know, the pop culture representations of our industry, movies like The Wolf of Wall Street, movies like The Big Short, which are not at all an accurate representation of the work that, or the, the people who Katrina and I have worked with over the decades, but nonetheless become the prevailing narrative about the industry, then it doesn't take long to realize that what we're up against is a set of structural challenges that's very hard to fix without a holistic look at the pipeline and the supply chain into our industry. Uh, well, I'm an economic analyst for the government, and so not quite the exact same field, but I feel like the STEM world kind of sees a lot of this. Um, and so there's a concept in your book called the investment management flywheel. And so it's kind of the reality that if your company isn't recruiting at the low levels and you don't see the representation in the mid level, and then there's a representation in the executive level. Um, and we just recently got some data coming back showing kind of the gender breakdown. Um, I'm at DHS and so it shows by grade level in the government. And they're actually doing pretty well at like hiring at the beginning levels women, it's about 50%. And then it starts tailing off really rapidly. So um, maybe Katrina, if you can talk a little bit more about this flywheel concept and then how it makes change difficult, even if you are able to start kind of hiring at some levels, retain, retaining retention, I know is a big problem uh, for women in the industry. So how do you make change 
with this uh, flywheel concept in mind. So I'm going to just address them in reverse order. So I will explain the flywheel, but let's just talk about this thing. We talk about equalizing the three P's, which is pay, performance, and promotion cadence. And I think that promotion cadence is feeding into the data that you're seeing. Um, and we see it within our own data. So what it is, is that women are promoted at a slower pace than their male counterparts. And you know, we've heard it. We've heard that women are promoted based on performance. Men are promoted based on potential. And we need to have that same standard. And so when you look at this recruitment, I have heard time and time again, we are recruiting gender equity. You know, we've got gender equity at our recruiting level. Why don't we keep and retain them? And I think part of the problem is, is we're not promoting them fast enough and we're not promoting at them as the same rate. And that has two implications. Um, first of all, um, we just don't have as many women moving from that entry into the next. But secondly, if you see the person sitting next to you who's performed the same as you getting a promotion and you're not it kind of makes you really wonder why am I working at this company you know are they do they have my best interests at heart and one of the pieces of advice that you know when we did our interviews is someone said to go and work at a company which has an HR department because hopefully in a company with an HR department we're going to see those types of you know, differences be addressed you know, salesforce.com is at the forefront they were the ones who identified this and talked about it. It's not necessarily that the other people didn't know. You talked about your role as being your data analytics and analyzing things. And that's what Ellen and I do. We, that's what investment management is all about is data analytics. We have all the data. We need to just turn the lens inward. Um, so I think that that is part of the reason that you see this gap and this lack of women. Um, and then that leads into the other thing. So what we were very fortunate to do was to partner with Rutgers University. There was a professor who is part of the, the Rutgers Women in Business Center, and she spearheaded a research project that was conducted by um, five of her undergraduate students who have now graduated. And they went out and surveyed undergraduates at universities to find out what were the barriers. And one of the key barriers was this idea is that women did not get exposure to female role models. So, you know, you can't be what you can't see. And if you don't see someone, they don't have to look identical, but that you can see yourself in, you tend not to apply to that career. Because if you look up and don't think that there are opportunities for women in the company, because it's led by five white men, you're not likely to apply to that company. And I think that that's very, very telling. Um, and if you don't have, um, if you don't have women entering into the profession, so you're not recruiting them, you're exactly right. You if you're not recruiting them, we can't retain them. If we can't retain them, we can't promote them. And if we can't promote them, we don't have senior, you know, senior female leaders at the top. The other aspect of finance, I think Ellen touched on this, but I want to just expound a little more, is this idea of the portrayal of finance in the media. Um, but one of the things is that we get a gold medal because of this bad portrayal and bad media industry or image that we really don't want to be proud of. And that is, we are the worst. Um, you know, it's funny, I talk to my, my kids and my kids will be like, you are the worst mother in the world. And I'm like, thank you. You know, I, you know, being the third worst, that's just kind of easy. Second, but being the absolute worst takes a lot of effort. And I say that jokingly aside, this is something we shouldn't be proud of. We shouldn't be so proud of being bad to work for. Um, and what does that mean though? Well, the research comes out of Germany. Um, and what the research showed is that women will not work for bad companies and bad industries, no matter what you pay them. Men on the other hand will. As long as you pay them enough money, they're happy to go and work for bad companies and bad industries. And so with this bad image, we're not recruiting and attracting women into finance. So we're even though we're getting gender diversity, we may not be retaining them once they find out we, they perceive us as bad. So what can we do? Well, we need to highlight the good that we do. You know, we talk to companies about their environmental, social and governance issues. You know, we hold them accountable for their scope one and scope two and scope three emissions. We encourage them to have labor force policies that treat their employees well. We encourage them to have governance structures that treat all shareholders fa fairly. So we do a lot of good. And then secondly, you know, 
if I invest and I make better decisions and, and make returns that exceed the market with lower risk, that helps my clients achieve financial security. And I think that we need to really highlight that that's a benefit of investment management. And that puts us in the good people category, not in the bad people category. So, you know, we, we say it in the book, you know, Houston, we do have an image problem. And I think that that is something that is a deterrent to getting more women into investment management. Yeah, and Katrina, I mean, you mentioned how if there's not people kind of in the higher levels to look up to, it can be really hard. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the other things that you always hear, at least young females coming into the workforce here, is that, like, oh, you just need an ally. You need a mentor or a sponsor. Um, but if you don't see somebody, it can be hard to know, like, who to reach out to or how to even form those relationships. And so, Ellen, um, maybe if you can kind of go into a little bit the differences between mentors, sponsors, and allies and how each of them are so important. Yeah, the, one of my favorite quotes from the book, we have lots of great quotes in the book from other people, not from Katrina and me. I mean, we said lots of great things too. But um, <laughs> one of my favorite quotes from the book is uh, from the woman who runs Goldman Sachs's, one of their big equity strategies on the, the asset management side, Katie Koch. And her comment was, women chronically underinvest in networking. And when I think about mentors, allies, and sponsors, um, I really associate all of those with some form of networking. And I, I fear that networking strikes fear into the hearts of many people, that just the word itself, including me. Um, you don't love the idea of like sort of walking around a room, um, trying to get in on a conversation. Um, but this industry has so much um, political capital that needs to be invested and spent as you build your career, as you have those bad years. So one of the, the tough parts about being an investor is that you are going to be wrong sometimes. And that's when you need um, these sponsors. So sponsors we talk about as being champions of the person, whether it's a man or a woman. I, I would um, put words in Katrina's mouth here to say that both of us have primarily had sponsors who are men, just given the demographics of our industry. Um, so the adage goes, Mentors are people who talk about you when you're in the room. Sponsors are people who talk about you when you're not in the room. And so you really do need those organically formed relationships, which again can spring from networking types of opportunities um, to push you ahead in your career. As far as mentors are concerned, I really think of those as being kind of those nuts and bolts people who when you start your career, sometimes you're even assigned a mentor, right? So if you're thinking about a research analyst position, which was my first position in investing, my mentor uh, was a senior portfolio manager, and she, it actually was a woman, read my research reports, provided feedback on them. She was a potential consumer of the ideas that I was producing. And so you really do need that as you're starting in your career to navigate those different types of meeting structures and, and report writing and the conversations that you're likely to have. And then we talk about allies in the context of kind of everyone else in the industry who may not have, you know, a direct mentorship relationship with you or who may not be championing you in um, a sponsor type of way in a promotion meeting. But these allies are super important because they should be filtered throughout the organization and they should be people who are watching out for underrepresented demographics of every demographic. So we focus on um, women in our book because we are both women, but there are certainly lots of other demographics that are very poorly represented in investment management. The job of allies is not necessarily to be the one in there arguing Ellen needs her promotion, but they are the people who listen carefully in investment meetings, for example. And when they hear that the man who's talking more loudly than the woman and with more conviction and confidence than the woman is getting a lot more traction with his investment idea, the ally's role is really to push back on that and say, okay, um, but we haven't heard from you know, this woman who has not spoken up in the meeting, or I'd love to hear about your idea because you haven't had as much airtime as, as your male counterpart. So we really think of all of those as being super important to the progression of women in the industry and to making sure that we recognize the good investment ideas that may come from voices that are not the loudest. 
And I just want to jump in there. Is, I mean, I've been a portfolio manager for you know a long period of time. And I think one of the key things that we do badly is to confuse um, confidence and competence. And and the fact is, you know, you think about it, you have that really confident male who goes, yes, this is a 10 bagger. You're going to like blow the lights out here. I am so confident in this investment idea. And then you have the, a, a female who has probably done all the work, presents the upside as well as the downside and says, you know, this is a 40% up a 10 down. Um, and you understand those risks, but she may do it in a much more balanced way and not with that high level of confidence in what we perceive as conviction, where from an investment point of view, that balanced view is actually a better investment than the person who says it's just going to be that 10 bagger. So I think we need to change what we're doing as well in that sense. Great. And if we can go back to the book for just a moment, you highlight a, a whole constellation of women, um, female investors in the book. So if you can talk maybe Katrina a little bit about how you chose these women to highlight, and then if there are some common themes throughout their stories. Yes, yeah, so we we um, we select we interviewed over a hundred people for the book. Um, at least fifty of them were successful portfolio managers. We were really deliberate in the way that we selected. We actually would only interview women that we had been referred to. We didn't want to take my Rolodex or an Ellen's Rolodex and just use people within our network because we realized that we wouldn't get a diverse range of voices doing that. And you know, some of the ways that we got introductions was one of our mutual fund board trustees made an introduction to a number of portfolio managers um, for us. Sometimes it was you know, a person we knew who was an allocator and they would make recommendations of women that we should interview for the book and we'd be interested in talking to, talking to us. So you know, we also made a very deliberate decision. I think we interviewed some women who wanted to potentially uh, be anointed by us as the you know, female Warren Buffett. And we were very, very deliberate to make sure that we didn't do that. We did consider it, but in, in our from our perspective, you know, all of the women that we interviewed had such diverse experiences and, and diverse ways that they became successful. And we wanted to highlight that diversity um, to showcase to, to younger women that there are many ways to be successful. And when I say younger, not just entry level, but the analysts, there's just not one pathway towards success. And so in the same way that we highlight diversity and the benefits of diversity in the decision-making team, we wanted to also highlight the diversity of you know, home life situations and thing and everything. And, you know, we had all different types of people. We had, you know, some people like myself, dual, you know, dual income, you know, I have children. We had single people who had kids later in life. Some had them early. We had one woman who had uh, cats, not children. Um, so we had all a whole spectrum of people. And I think that, you know, we really do want to show that it's a constellation. There's not just one model of success in this business, which is why if you want to enter it, you don't need to think that you had to have gone to Harvard, graduated top of your class, gone on to Harvard Business School or to Columbia Business School, seems Ellen's there, um, and, and gone through the value investing program. And that's the only way to get into investment management and you know, to be in the office from six in the morning until 12 midnight every single night. We want to really debunk that type of myth. Um, I do want to just mention again, if you are watching, we have the Q&A open. So we have about 15 minutes left of questions, um, and then we will open it up to everyone in the audience tonight. So go ahead and type your questions if you can, please, into the Q&A. Um, that way I can just kind of go through them a little bit later. It's, it's easier than the chat. So into the Q&A. Um, and then I also just want to say we got a really great partnership with the Columbia University Press. Um, so we can get the books. I think I sent out the code when I sent out the email, but I believe they gave us 40% off. So it's, it's a great price. Make sure you go to their website, not Amazon or something, um, so that you can read the book and have a hard copy of it. Um, I think it's always easier to read hard copies than Kindle versions. Um, okay. So and, yeah, Miyako, can I actually just interrupt on the, on the point of the book? Um, Katrina and I always love to make this clear. We're donating all the royalties of the book um, or from the book, which I'm sure would have been massive, to an organization called Rock the Street Wall Street, which we profile in the book. They go into public high schools and um, people like Katrina, 
um, actually educate girls in high school about the career opportunities in finance generally, not just investment management. So really know that, you know, when you buy the book, not only are you getting a great deal because you're getting 40% off and you get to read a terrific book, but your money is actually going towards addressing the issues that we talk about in the book. Sorry, I'll, I'll be quiet. That's, that's awesome. Thanks so much for letting us know. Um, Ellen, in the book, you address several topics that aren't always easy to bring up in corporate settings, uh, let alone any other setting, but there's the token woman problem or there's a confidence issue and gender gaps and confidence. Um, and then, you know, I think we, we talked a little bit already, but how Hollywood portrays women specifically in finance. Um, so in your research and in, through the interviews, what kind of societal factors re resonated with you the most? So I'm already taking a sneak peek at some of the, the questions that are coming up in the Q&A chat. Thanks everyone for your great questions. And one of them asks um, about a comment I made earlier about the holistic structures that need to be broken down in our industry. Um, and I'd love to start right there with confidence. So Katrina mentioned this in, in one of her earlier responses as well, but confidence is something that studies show women are at a structural deficit. Um, as it relates to, to confidence. And there's a great book called The Confidence Code. Um, the, the two authors of that book wrote an Atlantic article several years ago that distills the, um, the takeaways from their book. So you don't have to read the book. Um, but the point here is that women are chronically underconfident relative to men. And while we believe that this is very important in all of corporate America, it is particularly important in our industry because as Katrina mentioned, this is an industry that lionizes confidence. And so when you start out as an investment analyst, you are asked to bring your high conviction ideas. Now, keep in mind, you probably went to Columbia Business School before you became an analyst. And what they teach you in business school is that actually you can't beat the market, right? So I, I, there are lots of people that take issue with efficient markets hypothesis. But by and large, Finance 101 says markets are efficient. Therefore, you know, unless you have a terrific mousetrap, you're not going to beat the market. So you're starting from the perspective of I'm going against what I learned in my investing 101 class that I can beat the market. And then you're taking that and you're finding these high conviction ideas, which it's implicitly say the rest of the market is wrong because I identified something that is underpriced relative to its intrinsic value. That requires a lot of confidence. And it continues once you transition from analyst to portfolio manager, um, because when you're a portfolio manager, you walk into client meetings and you explain the composition of your portfolio, which definitionally looks different from that of your index, because that's what you're paid for to be an active money manager. And you say, my portfolio is going to outperform the index because I have taken these positions that argue that the market is inefficient. So on the one hand, you've got that confidence issue, which if women are less confident than men, it means that they are not perceived to be expressing this conviction, which to a fault, our industry has said is par for the course, is something that you have to have to be a good investor. The other side of the confidence issue relates to the job itself. So if you think about, there's a great question about um, law in the chat box as well. But if you think about other careers, they generally have a followed, a, a very standard path. So if you work at a law firm and you want to be at the top of your game, then you get on the partner track, right? And so you know that there's a standard set of billable hours that you have to have. You probably have to bring in a certain number of clients. I'm sort of talking out of my depth here because thank God I've never been a lawyer. Um, but the point is there are some prescribed hoops that you jump through to get to that level of partner. Um, the same would be true in the medical profession. You know, you, you do your residency and then you become a doctor. In investment management, transitioning from analyst to portfolio manager is a much fuzzier conversation and set of to-dos, and it probably differs somewhat by firm. Katrina does a great job of talking about how you do that, but the takeaway that I'm trying to arrive at here is that it takes a lot of confidence for you, a very good analyst, to raise your hand and say, I am self-promoting myself um, into the role of portfolio manager. Here's why I would be a good portfolio manager. I know that I can do this job. We know that there's um, a Harvard Business School case study that says that men will apply for a job if they have 60% of the skills, whereas women feel like they have to have 100%. 
And in this role, being willing to apply for that job of portfolio manager after you've done a good job as an analyst really requires a tremendous amount of confidence. And um, that can just leave women um, left at the analyst role or even opting out of the industry entirely. Uh, well, and speaking of leaving the industry entirely, especially now with COVID, there have been a lot of articles coming out about women being really affected by the pandemic. Um, a lot of them have taken a step back to work with kids at home who were like doing schooling online. Um, and then apparently many of them are actually opting to stay out of the workforce altogether, not going back in. Um, is this consistent with what you've observed? And Katrina, maybe what can we do about it? Um, in terms of the, the leaving the workforce, a lot of the job losses for women were in service industry jobs where women tended to be overrepresented. And I don't want to make a generic statement, except you know, a lot of you know, certain areas of service tend to be more, you, you need more empathy, for example. And so you tend to have women in there, but the statistics play out. So a lot of those job losses were just related to the nature of the service industry. In my business, I haven't seen anyone in, in investment management not return to the office. I mean, working from home has been phenomenal. Uh, for me, it's just, it's been great. I mean, Zoom is fabulous. I've seen more insides of the houses of CEOs than I really wish to, but that's fine. They're all now back in their office, so I don't need to see what their home office looks like. But you know, we were able to continue to do our job to do throughout the pandemic. Um, if I take a look at it, there's a study that came out of Rutgers. because there's a lot of different studies that have happened over the course of the pandemic. And and, and Ellen and I always debate this because I'm the equity investor. So for me, glass is always half full. Ellen, the glass is always half empty. And if I really want to be you know, funny about it, I tell her there's a hole in the bottom and it's leaking um, because that's what a high yield investor is looking for. Um, but, you know, if I look at it, men went from doing 11% of men went, you know, they, they, before, before the pandemic, um, the number of the percentage of men who were doing five hours or more of housework went from 11% to 20 now, that's pretty abysmal, given that most women I know do five hours of home or housework or you know, associated house chores in one evening. So you know, we're not talking about a particularly high bar here, but it was a significant change. More importantly, though, you know, when we think about it, we are all about business. okay? And, and in a business where your assets sleep at night and go home at night, you, know, you need it's a knowledge based career. And so you want to have you know, people in your business that are productive and happy. And that was one of the things that has been very interesting over COVID is in two working households where you know, the women have seen greater contribution from men to house chores. They're actually more productive and they're happier. So, you know, this working from home and flexible schedule has really helped a lot of women. As we look going forward, there's a couple of things that we really hope that we can take away from this. First of all, is that, you know, working from home beforehand used to be associated with female employees. Now it's associated with both male and female employees, and we want that to continue. The second thing is that I know a lot of people talk about guys who say, hey, I'm, I'm leaving work early to go for, to, to watch my son's 4 p.m. soccer game or to coach the 5 p.m. Little League. Well, that's great. I want to keep seeing those, but we also need men to have permission to do those other things, which are the unexpected appointments, because they're the ones that are really challenging. So when, you know, as I say, little Johnny wakes up and he's got a runny nose and he needs to go to the doctor and you've got to move your nine o'clock and get someone to move it to the thing so you can take him to the doctor, find out what's wrong. And maybe if you need to get back up childcare or whatever. It's those unexpected things that men need to do as well as women and men need to be given the permission. And I'm hoping that COVID through changing the work from home narrative from, um, will also therefore change that narrative as well, as well in terms of giving senior female, male executives the permission to do the unexpected appointments as well as the expected ones. And so I hope that. The one final thing, I talked about equalizing the three Ps and I, I, I just want to walk through that because I really do think it's one of the fundamental premises of what we talk about in the book as being the starting point of doing all of this. Um, 
the you know equalizing pay is been something people have talked about for a long time. Um, women, however, for the same objective level of performance, get a lower performance rating. So we need to fix that. And then women um, also get promoted slower. And during COVID, that that extended out. So only nine percent of women got promoted during COVID, and thirty four percent of men did. And so that promotion gap has extended and we need to narrow that, not extend that. And the reason this is all so important is if you have lower pay, slower move up in your career, so to the next pay level and lower bonuses, the MPB of that female career is less than a male career. And all we talk about throughout the entire book we don't blame the men at all during the book. And all we ask for is equal. I mean, and we want to be equalizing the three Ps. We don't want to be compensated for the, the sins of the past. We just want to get to parity. And I think that that's something is a strong message and a message we've continually discussed with, with um, people we talk to about the book. Uh, that's, that's great. And Ellen, I think the book ends with a money manifesto and a call to arms to the agents who can make changes. Um, and it's of course not just in the investment management, it's, it's all over different industries. Um, and we had somebody question, you know, they're an employer, how can they, um, if they wanna hire more women, how can they do that? So I think a lot of people wanna know, like how do they actually go about making this better and addressing those three Ps? Um, so kind of how can these various segments actually enact change? I'm going to let Katrina talk about the um, job descriptions because she has a great anecdote about this. Um, but in terms of the, the money manifesto, we issued this call to arms to what we viewed as the diaspora participants in our industry. We talked earlier about the media representations of investment management, which are, you know, in some cases misrepresented dramatically. So the big short and the Wall Street. Um, I think that the popular press has a real role to play here as well. So if you read even the Financial Times and the Wall Street Journal, which are really the most investment-oriented mainstream publications, you'll read lots of stories about hedge fund bros. And while the hedge fund community is huge, we know that that's true, um, it is not where Katrina and I work. And it is not the only job when we're even, frankly, the biggest um, number of jobs in investment management. So I think more down to earth, honest coverage of the types of people who do this job and the working environment that, that many of us have enjoyed and appreciated and you know, felt very comfortable at, and at home in um, would be super helpful. We also issue a call to arms to all the people in our industry, but in particular the women, to make sure that they're out there being part of the constellation that Katrina mentioned. So do events like this, um, go to conferences, go to high schools with Rock the Street, Wall Street, if you have anything to do with finance, and tell girls and young women and even older women about the job that you have um, and how much you enjoy it and how it can be um, just a terrific career. The final call to arms um, that I think might be relevant to a lot of people on this, this Zoom, since we're we're looking at a broad audience, it's not just Columbia Business School, is really to any of you who have money invested with somebody else. So unless you've got your own Robinhood account and you're pulling um, the trigger on all the different ideas that you have, if you own a mutual fund, look at the prospectus. Ask who the people are who are managing the mutual fund. Katrina is, I'm sure, a listed portfolio manager in the funds that she manages in. If you have a financial advisor, you can look for a female financial advisor, but you could also just ask your financial advisor to give you more disclosure about the people who are managing the money that, that, that your retirement assets are invested in. So we feel like that's super important and something that all of us can do. It's sort of like putting in your um, LED light bulbs, right? We can all do that to help with climate change. I think we can push the needle forward or push, push gender diversity forward by doing that. Katrina, you should talk about the job thing. I think that you know the job description is one area where we think is really easy and 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 and, 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 and it's an easy lift and something that needs to to we we think really can change and make a difference. So you know I, I always laugh. I get bored in usually after we've put a job after someone's put out a job description and they get a really low female response rate and then I get this job description and they'll talk to me and I'll be like, well read it, I can understand why no woman wanted to apply for the job. So what are the things that we see? First of all, we see heavily gendered language. Um, 
the, my favorite is the strong Excel modeling skills. Now, I can tell you, I have never met modeling skills that bench press, okay? So they don't lift weights, they're not strong. Number one, so that's the first thing is getting rid of the strong. But secondly, you know, we interviewed all these portfolio managers and Ellen can jump in. No one said, I really love my job because I get to Excel model all day. I mean, that wasn't what made them successful. Why did they love their job and why were they successful? Intellectual curiosity, the ability to handle a, an environment where every day changes. Um, you know, every single day we wake up, something is different, be it at a company level, be it a macro level, and you need to be able to work in that type of environment. Um, and I personally think women are probably even better at operating in those environments than men, but I don't want to make that. I don't think it, there's a gender, too much of a gendered element, but I do think that women do have the skill set. And let's not focus about these kind of nice to have skills. Um, you know, when, if anyone ever has on a list of prerequisites or requirements for the job, the word preferred, I just nixed out the entire line. I don't even read past what the preferred thing was because if it's just preferred it's not necessary and you need to take out what we call those nice to have things or things you'd like and think about what do you really need to be successful in this job so that this the other element that you need to do is you need to lead with purpose and when I say leading with purpose I've seen so many companies that lead with this is who we are aren't we so great like let's pat myself on the back and things like that and no one wants that they want to understand what is the role in the position, how is it going to help me grow and develop as an employee? You know, what are the mentorships? What's the collaboration? Will I be work, working you know, by myself? And I've seen job descriptions for jobs where it's very collaborative, but the job description was written to sound like you were sitting in a basement in front of a compute, computer entering numbers into various cells. And that's not what we were looking for. And that's not what the job is. So we really need to think about what some of our language does. So I do a lot of work with, um, I've worked with some of the pen, our pension plan clients to help them repurpose those job descriptions. Um, one final aspect that, they, that we need to do better, and, and we've, we keep talking about it, but we need to incorporate into the job descriptions the good that we're doing and highlighting that, that, that we do make a difference. And, and I think that when we see these changes, we do have a higher female response rate. What I think happens is going back to this, if you've got 10 skills, men apply, you know, men apply if they've got six, women wait, make and wait until they've got all 10. If you're taking out some of the skills because they're not necessary, I think you're still getting the same number of men applying. What you're doing is getting a lot more females applying for the same job. So I don't think that, I think this is one where it's expanding the pie versus you know actually contracting things okay well, i think that was great answers so jennifer i hope that helped um, with your job description question all right i'm going to go back to one of the earliest questions that we got um and so i think they're talking about how much of the problem is a pipeline issue and how much do you think is attributable to the level of braggadocio swagger kind of self-promotion needed for success in investment management and the historical tendency toward greater humility, socialization of women than men? Yeah, I think that really goes to the confidence question. So again, it is, it is an industry where you are expected to express high conviction, even if um, that conviction, you know, is not necessarily justified in, in most cases. So I think that absolutely goes um, right to that confidence issue. Um, Miyaga, I'd like to take the liberty of, of addressing the second question about confidence. So why do women have such a confidence de deficit? Um, if you can figure that out, I'd love to hear it. But we know that this is persistent in so many different ways. So there are studies that say, for example, that young women consistently rate their ability to do math lower than comparable male peers. And this goes all the way back to, you know, junior high, elementary school. So there is something cultural. Um, I'd love to think that we can fix it. Um, but I think that in this generation, and maybe maybe my sons and Katrina's kids' generations will, um, will fix it. But I just don't think, I think that our role in the investment management industry is to address it and to be aware of it um, and make sure that we are calibrating for, for that structural deficit. 
Okay, this question came in early as well, and I definitely was thinking about it the whole time. So I know um, you guys focused on women and in investment management, but where does the U.S. stand, especially among developed nations in this regard? Do we see other countries that are much more successful at this than we are, and can we learn any lessons from them? Um, the global statistic isn't that much better. Um, I think it's 14%. So, you know, for me, that that type, that that's within a random standard deviation. So I, I just don't think anyone's really figured out why why there is this deficit. So I think it's 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 just difficult to learn because they are at the same place that we are. We are, and you know, different jurisdictions have different initiatives. So you know, the UK, for example, has the Diversity Project, which I, I believe is coming across here to the United States. You know, we've had had things like the 30% club. Um, you know, one of the things where Ellen and I are really clear about, and I think this is where we diverge with like the consensus, is this idea that 30% is great. Um, I think the 30% for us is something when we did the research was something we found that was very surprising is when you add diversity to a homogeneous team, the performance of the team actually initially declines. And that is because there's a cost of communication of integrating that person who has maybe a different background to you. Um, maybe English may not be their first language. There's, there's various reasons that have that communication cost. Um, but you know what happens is at 30%, the minority goes from being what they call a salient minority to an acknowledged voice or a heard voice in the room. So 30% is really important. But let's put our business hats on because, you know, we, we talk about having CEOs in the room and we need to justify why this makes sense. So you've got two firms, one's at zero and one's at 30 percent diversity. So think about it from the perspective of the person at 30. They've already suffered all of that cost. That's all in the, the rearview mirror. And they're about to get all the returns from diversity, which is your know, better investment decision making, um, more innovation and everything. So they're already ahead there versus the person at zero when they start adding diversity diversity, they're going to see that performance decline. They've still got to go through that dip. Secondly, we haven't talked a lot about the allocators, but the allocators are allocating more money or allocating money to diverse teams. So the person who's at 30% is ahead of the person at zero. So you've got the money flow and you've got the positive performance on one side and the person who's got zero diversity has got the negative performance as well as the lack of money flow. So, you know, despite, you know, not only is diversity you know, good from a, an equality and a fairness point of view, we think it's also good in terms of business and, and positioning people for success. Um, in terms of that 30% hurdle, Ellen is a marathon runner. I'm a former marathon runner. And, you know, we look at this as being a marathon. And 30% to us is the half marathon marker. It's a very impressive achievement to run a half marathon. But if you're running the full marathon, you know, we're in it for the long run. So I think that that's how we see that 30% target it's the halfway point to achieving that 50% equity. And there is a whole chapter in the book on allocators. Um, Ellen, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit more about that um, and how are you seeing kind of a change in the attitude and approach of these capital allocators and who's doing a good job? So I think that it's, it's interesting because a lot of the impetus for it is coming from the public sector. So if you look at the big retirement funds, New York State, New York City, CalPERS, CalSTRS, um, these organizations have taken a very vocal and proactive approach with their consultants. So in, in our world, these aren't management consultants like McKinsey. These are firms like Wilshire and Cambridge and a whole long tail of um, consulting firms, investment management consulting, who are tasked, among other things, with finding diverse managers. And what I think is super encouraging is that not only are we seeing that there's a new universe of what are called emerging manager um, consultants. Um, so these are the types of firms that my firm, which is majority women owned, but a fairly small firm would, would interact with. Um, they're looking for diverse managers, but we're also seeing it go all the way up to the level of the Wilshires and the Cambridges of the world. I sit on an endowment um, uh, committee, investment committee, we use Cambridge as our consultant, and we ask Cambridge to tell us what the demographics are of the people who manage our money um, for this endowment. And the reason we did that is because we thought about ESG 
um, environmental social governance um, approaches to sustainable investing. And while that is very much where the heart of this organization lives, it got super challenging to come up with, you know, a, a an ESG strategy that we felt would address all of the different constituencies of this organization. We decided that the best way that we could embrace some of the principles of ESG was not to look at the underlying investments and say, no fossil fuels or, you know, Tesla is bad because Elon Musk is crazy. Um, but rather to say, let's look at the people who are managing the money and let's make sure that those are more diverse than what we have traditionally had. So I'm hopeful that this will continue to move the needle. The problem is you're starting from such a low base. So only 1% of investable assets in the global universe of money management is managed by firms that are either majority women-owned or majority um, non-Caucasian-owned. So it's just going to take a whole lot more of these mandates before that, that really starts to push in the right direction. Okay, we had a bunch of questions come in. I'm going to try and combine them here, but a lot of people are noticing that it does seem like maybe there is more, there are more females coming into certain business school classes. Um, John says, you know, Wharton's MBA class of 2023 is actually 52% female. So hoping that that's promising. Um, but somebody else noted a little bit earlier that women comprise about 40% or more business school students, but they have a much lower percentage in business related careers. So they must eventually decide to do something else. So they're asking kind of what careers do they actually end up opting for or changing? And then I think Cynthia Lee, you mentioned a little earlier, the law school alum mentioned, you know, again, 50% generally coming in, but then they tend to go and do something else. Um, so I don't know, maybe could you? Yeah, you well, I'll take a stab at the, the business school question, because I, th I think this first question about the 40%, you know, not choosing business related careers. So what? What we were saying is that a much smaller fraction of the Columbia student body is pursuing investment careers. Most people who go to Columbia Business School are going to end up doing something in business. Now, who knows how long they stay there? Who knows if they end up changing careers entirely? But that, that was the point we were making there. Um, in terms of John's question about, you know, the Wharton MBA class of 2023 being 52 percent female, um, that is encouraging, but I think it's going to take a lot more intentionality on the part of some of these more investment-oriented um, business school programs to really get that number of women seeking investing careers up. Great example here is that Columbia Business School, I'd like to think it has something to do with our book, um, but they managed to get the value investing program, which is really the capstone investing program um, widely viewed as a springboard into investment management, they got it up above 25% women um, for the first time this year. It's a, a close to a third female. And that is in large part because they devoted a lot of time and resources, and this gets to another of the question, in promoting and highlighting investment management careers for women. So they are doing some pre-matriculation um, pre um, programs with women to make sure that new um, uh, admittance into the Columbia Business School classes are aware of these career choices. They match them up with mentors from firms like Katrina's, um, from my alma mater, and they really give them an earlier shot at preparing themselves, sorry, that's my dog, for what is a very intense recruiting process and what can be off-putting to someone who is a career changer, which is supposed to be what business school is for. But because the velocity of recruiting has become so rapid in investment management, and because these are very good jobs that there aren't as many of as there are, for example, investment banking, you really have to hit the ground running as a first year to do your stock pitch, to line up that summer internship, which hopefully leads to the full-time job. So I think more intentionality around that at the major business school programs will help to encourage women in those programs to pursue um, um, careers in investing. Okay, so Pat had asked if, if there are business schools doing a better job in promoting and highlighting investment management careers for women. I think that kind of goes along. It, it does seem like at least, hopefully, it is getting better at, at promoting some of that. Um, 
Okay, just a few questions left and we still do have some time. So if you do have questions, um, keep typing them into the Q&A. Uh, okay, so the next question is, speaking of the different paths, so this was uh, about half an hour ago, uh, but how much of an effect do you think the myth of meritocracy affects women's choices? Um, I, I think we go back to this idea of the MPV of the career, and this is why we really have focused a lot of the work and a lot of our initial talking about the book is doing is, is just equalizing that playing field early on. And, and, and the reason is, is if, if women are, are, are being told that it, it's a meritocracy, but the data doesn't support it, they know that their male counterpart down the road is getting that promotion quicker, and they can see that or if they find out that they're getting higher bonuses or if they know that they're getting a higher base pay, you know, it is a myth of merit meritocracy because it isn't a meritocracy. You know, when we talk about what we studied, however, however, you know, when we look at what investment management is, it is this industry that is defined by objective performance criteria. And so when I talk about objective performance criteria, it is, you know, I know if I beat the benchmark or I didn't beat the benchmark. Um, I know that on a daily basis, actually. So I have all that information. And so when you have that objective performance criteria, we've been able to study a lot of these barriers. And the barriers are the three Ps. We talk about the lack of confidence. We also talk about the fact that, you know, women, for example, when they're offered a promotion, will ask questions. And they don't just suddenly say, yes, I want it. They ask questions and people misinterpret that question asking as lack of interest. So there's so many little barriers, but the good thing is they're easy to overcome. There's no one silver bullet to change the lack of diversity in both our industry as well as other industries. And particularly, we've talked about the tech industry, but even other knowledge-based industries where we've heard, heard time and time again from women that I read your book and all, you know, exact, all the things that you talked about that occurred in your industry have happened to me. And I really appreciate that the 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 you know the the you know the the pathway that you've opened you've offered and the solution set that you've offered. So you know we wrote the book like a traditional investment report where we have the introduction and the the setting the background. We have the analysis in the middle, and then we have the solutions at the end, and we have the final investment recommendation with that, which is that money manifesto. Uh, so there's a question here that came in asking very speculative kind of, you know, what if we had had more women in finance at the great financial crisis? Like what it could have been avoided? And I saw, you know, a tweet the other day that was like, oh, well, if there were two female presidents, we would never have any war. Um, and so I think, you know, there's sometimes a lot of positive thinking on what women might be able to accomplish if they were to get into more positions where they had kind of controls of levers of power, um, but specifically in investment management, have you seen that when they do have women getting into positions of portfolio managers, that they are able to um, either have the same results as men or perform better? Like, have you seen any of those results in your field specifically? Yeah, well, I don't know if people um, know the comment that Christine Lagarde, who's the IMF chair made, I believe it was her, but she said, if Lehman Brothers had been Lehman Sisters, then none of this would have happened. Um, I don't actually believe that. What I do believe is that if there had been more diverse decision makers, that we probably would not have gotten into the situation that we did with the global financial crisis, crisis because guess what? More diverse perspectives bring in a greater heightened sense of risk and nuance and different, um, you know, ways of understanding what could go wrong. So our book, as Katrina mentioned, is very much not about blaming men and saying that men shouldn't have jobs in investment management and women are the only ones who are good at it. It is saying that the more diverse your investment team is, the more likely you're going to be in the long term to outperform your benchmark, um, which our industry does not do. So this is an industry that, you know, on the one hand does not outperform its benchmark net of fees, which is what we told everybody we were going to do. On the other hand, is very homogenous, and it doesn't seem like it takes a rocket scientist to make that, um, that correlation obvious. Um, in terms of the outperformance of, you know, one gender versus the other, we 
didn't do, there aren't a lot of studies on it, primarily because there just aren't that many women. And so immediately you introduce the, the question of survivor bias. So if we know that only 10% of women or portfolio managers are women, then that means that if you compare the results of that 10% versus the 90%, then probably they are going to be better, right? Because you're getting 10%, you know, you, you have a much more rarefied air for these women who succeed in the industry. Having said that, the small number of studies that, that do some attempt at comparing returns show that they are, you know, no different. Um, certainly women aren't worse investors than men. The oldest study that we found was one that was actually done of retail investors. So people like you and me um, who have brokerage accounts. And this was done quite some time ago, probably about 20 years ago. So it's a bit dated. But it showed that on average, women outperformed men in these retail brokerage accounts by, I believe, about 60 basis points a year. Now, that doesn't sound a lot like a lot until you think about the power of compounding. So it compounded over, say, a 20-year portfolio to a meaningful difference. The primary reason for that is because men traded more than women, and there are transaction costs that go along with trading. So... Here again, we go back to this, this confidence issue, right? If men are more confident in their investment ideas, then they might be more likely to turn over their portfolios because they think that they know something that the market doesn't, whereas a woman might be more likely to pick something that she's going to hold for a longer period of time and just wait it out. I think also one of that, that question also uh, raises another issue is that women were perceived as the, the, the financial crisis wouldn't happen because it's the perception is that women are, are more risk adverse. And we think that that perception is wrong. We think that women are willing to take risks. They're just aware of it. And, and that's very different to being risk aware as to being risk adverse. So I think that when we hear a lot of those comments, I think, you know, women would be, it, it's, it's that awareness of the risks of the investment. Now, that may have stopped the financial crisis because that awareness of the risk may have led to compliance decisions or other types of decisions that could have stopped you know, some of these bad investments being made. That's very difficult to prove. But I think that the one thing I wanted to address is the idea that people think it wouldn't happen because we're risk adverse and we would never have made those risky investments. Actually, we may have if the returns justified it, but we probably probably would be a, have a wit be more aware of the downside and what could have gone wrong. Okay, a couple questions left here. Um, again, going back to the confidence issue, I mean, I think it's, it's clear we don't really know what's causing it, but uh, there have been multiple attempts throughout the years to try and address it. So I know there's been studies that come out about how women negotiate less um, when they're trying to get uh, even starting offers or bonuses or, you know, any of that and doesn't always uh, come out. Um, so somebody's asking kind of around that and have there been any pay transparency laws that have made a difference in reducing gender-based pay disparities? I think somewhere in Europe might have tried to pass a law around gender kind of pay equity, and I'm not sure if you have any knowledge about that. Yeah, I think Citigroup is the is the one case study that we highlight where you're know, just disclosing the pay disparity you know, the following year, you saw it narrow. So I think it is that idea of highlighting the disparity makes people have to either comply or explain. And I think that a lot of the issue, however, we've seen is a lot of the pay disparity has been linked to the lack of women in decision-making roles. So, you know, even across various industries, we, we look at investment management, where the portfolio managers, where the decision makers. Um, if we take a look at, you know, other areas, so for example, the C-suite even. So these are successful people, but you look at the C-suite, men are overrepresented in the CEO role, which is the highest paying role. Um, and the, you know, the women are overrepresented in what we call more of the housekeeping type you know, parts, like the general counsel and the head of HR. And women are not given business line responsibility that lead to those CEO roles. So I think that we'd like to see more you know, diversity across that. And I think that highlighting the pay gap is the first step, but also using that to then highlight the difference in where women are given opportunities is the other thing. And we're increasingly seeing that. And I think it's important because um, we need to talk about it and we need to understand that there's a problem in order to be able to address the problem. 
Okay, um, I usually ask our guests if they have any recommendations for us for if we want to continue reading about this topic or watching, I mean, there's a ton of like Netflix documentaries out now, but are there any podcasts, books, um, authors? Obviously, again, we're going to share your book with the code and I misspoke earlier. It's a 20% discount code and it's ALUM, capital A-L-U-M. Um, so we will send that out again when we send the recording tomorrow. But um, maybe if Ellen, we can start with you and then go to Katrina, just any anybody, anything to kind of continue reading and getting smart on this, um, even just kind of you know, people who are managers, what can they do to try and get more women in? Like that question came in earlier. So I think it's, it, I'll, I'll give you two answers. The first is if you want another perspective on our industry from the, um, through the eyes of a woman who succeeded in a very male dominated um, part of our industry, distressed debt investing, there's a great book called Damsel in Distressed. It's a very easy read. Um, it's super fun and light, lighthearted, but it, it, it's sort of, does a great job of saying what the industry is like and giving you some of the structural barriers that women have um, to succeeding and, and gives you a blueprint for how this particular woman succeeded. Um, I really enjoyed the book Machiavelli for Women, which was written by Stacey Bennick Smith. You're not in the opera, maybe you read that as well. Yeah, I bought it and read it. She's also a Columbia alum. Oh yeah, I didn't know that actually. Well, I um, was super glad that our book came out first because <laughs> we, we actually say a lot of the same things. And um, since Stacey Bennick Smith probably has a bigger platform than we do, um, we probably would have been accused of plagiarism if it had not. But yeah, I think that that is a very kind of millennial and even Gen Z take on a lot of the issues that we talk about in the book. Look, pay transparency. When Certainly when I was growing up in the industry, if you talked about your pay, you got fired. I mean, there was a really big infrastructure and culture created around making sure that no one knew what everyone else met, made. At the time, it was it was presented as this sort of like, you know, um, com common decency or like politeness thing. But looking back, it was probably because they didn't want to tell you what the guy sitting next to you made. Um, so I think the Stacey Bennett Smith book does a great job of, of talking about that type of conversation and making it clear that that's my cat's tail. In this generation, um, people are going to have to, you know, speak up more and make sure that they understand their worth. I love that we have our, our pets. Mine's actually on a play date next door. Um, so. We, we, love, we love that. So two books, one is fun and one is, uh, is a little more serious. I, Iris Bonet, who's the Harvard, Harvard Business School professor, has written a lot about gender equity by design. And so she's done a lot of the um, new studying what types of systems work to address um, the lack of gender equality. Interestingly enough, through her research, she found that, you know, we, we've all heard about, you know, unconscious bias training. Interestingly enough, if you put someone through unconscious bias training, Training, it increases their bias. It gives them permission to continue to do what they were, what they're doing. So I think that sometimes we have good intentions with bad outcomes, and that's a great uh, a, a, an example there. Someone, what, you know, you raised the point about, you know, if we had two female presidents, we wouldn't have a war. I just did read The End of Men, which is a fictional book about, you know, a virus that takes out 90% of the male population. Interestingly enough, China is engaged in an internal war at the same time. So I'm not necessarily sure that... Um, you know, having women in charge would mean that we don't have an end of violence and everything, but that's just a, a fun example. It's fictional as well, but, it, and it was written actually pre-pandemic, the same thing about our book, which is we submitted our final cop, our final manuscript in April, 2020. So it wasn't actually a COVID, a COVID book. Um, but yeah, I think that, you know, we, you know, Ellen and I have written this we, we are very passionate about getting the message out. We are, I, I, I volunteer, Ellen, and, and I volunteer myself. We are happy to go and talk to companies. Um, I do it all the time in terms of going in and talking to the senior executives about what you can do um, to increase gender equality in your firm. We've highlighted some of it, um, but there are a number of different things that men can do and women can do. And we're really deliberate in the book about this idea idea that men are our allies, they're not our enemies, and we want them to be on this journey with us. And the reason is that 
as I've said repeatedly, you know, gender equality and, and diversity is good for business. And so this is not just a fairness and equity, it's also a good business decision to invest in equality because it makes for better decision making and better decisions in investment management mean better returns. Well, I think that's a, a great note to kind of end us on, but I do want to offer it up to uh, any closing remarks that either of you have, and then just mention again to everybody watching that uh, we are recording the event and we will be sharing the recording link tomorrow, as well as the link where you can buy the book again and that code for the discount. Um, so that will all be coming out tomorrow, um, but any closing thoughts, maybe Ellen and then Katrina? Yeah, I think we, I would just go back to our, our money manifesto and be curious about who manages your money. Um, you may be doing it yourself, but if you're not, ask the question about the diversity of the teams who manage your money, because there's going to, as we get more diversity in the industry, um, I feel strongly that results are going to improve. And I think that this is the silver bullet that the active investment management universe can use to get back to its position of um, dominance relative to the passive sector, um, like the vanguards and the Black Rocks of the world, I think diversity is at the absolute forefront of that. Yeah, and I, and I think I reiterate what Ellen said. I mean, we, we wrote the book with the intention of addressing something that hasn't been addressed for 20 plus years. We talk about that flywheel, but what Ellen and I are extremely focused is on changing like stopping you know kind of putting that proverbial stick in the wheel to stop it and then onboarding more women through recruiting onboarding more women at even some of the more senior roles so for example what BlackRock has done with their investing for investors program so I think that there are various different strategies that can onboard more women onto that flywheel and then the other thing is that just because we're talking about increasing diversity we are not talking about this as you know as narrowing the opportunities for men we think that if we can fight back against that passive share shift, we can grow this industry and we can just add more women into it without actually having to take away the jobs of men. So I think that that's important as well. All right. Well, thank you both so much. It was my absolute pleasure to get to talk with you tonight. Um, I hope everybody goes out and buys the book, gets to read it. I think there's a lot of really important information that we can all take away and then try and apply to our lives and our, our work. Um, we're already starting to get some comments and saying thank you again for writing the book. Uh, very inspired. Um, I am as well. So thank you both again and have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Miyako. Bye. Bye.